I'm joined now by our panelists. Tasha Carradine is a columnist with the National Post and iPolitics.ca. John Moore is a talk radio host in Toronto. And Steph Guthrie is a gender and politics commentator and the founder of Women in Toronto Politics. So we can get into what actually the law says or should say in just a moment, but you know, it's been an intense few weeks, lots of people coming forward with all of these sort of horrible stories and some allegations, but I wonder, haven't all of us had these discussions among our colleagues and friends about, you know, was I always perfectly clear? Did I handle every situation uh, perfectly? Did my partner? And I just, you know, it's, it's been, have you ever, I don't want, well, maybe I do want true confessions, <laughs> but I'm not going to ask for them. Have you ever seen a discussion like this before? No, I don't think so. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And it's been an intense few weeks. We've had one story after another from Cosby to Gomeshi to the business on Parliament Hill. And, and not all of the, you know, sexual encounters people are probably talking about amongst themselves. Are, 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 you know, as, as questionable as those ones are. I mean, it's just you, you probably are reviewing a lot of years of, uh, of, you know, couplings and thinking, I wonder if every time that was entirely the two of us had agreed to do it. Uh, Tasha? Yeah, I think there's also um, an issue of consent and regret, too, is that sometimes you may feel like you're consenting in the moment and then think, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. And I think a lot of people may be confused about that issue as well in the context of what you, those cases that are in the media. Um, I was at a women, an event for celebrating women just the other day in Toronto, women were talking about the Parliament Hill example in particular, and it was very difficult to find anyone who said, well, you know, the signals that were sent, if what was said was true, would not lead someone to think that there probably was consent. So it's a really gray area in many cases. Well, we don't know what happened, but you're referring mm -hmm. to the, 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 that she may have provided. That she may have provided a condom, and that was sort of a tipping point for a lot of people saying that that might have been an implication of consent. Whether the law agrees with that, of course, is a different matter. Get into that in a sec, but just your reaction to the discussions the last few weeks, Steph. Well, I have to say it's uh, it's been really great to see people finally engaging in this kind of discussion really frankly, uh, really reflecting on their own experiences uh, in terms of consent and sex. Um, it's, uh, it's uncomfortable conversation to be sure, uh, but I think it's a type of discussion that I'd love to see us having more frequently. Before we get into that, I think I found this really interesting, checking out what the law, the criminal code actually says. It says consent means the voluntary agreement of the complainant to engage in the sexual activity in question and that it's not a defense that the accused believed that the complainant consented to the activity. It also suggests the accused must have taken reasonable steps to ascertain that the complainant was consenting. So you read that and it sort of sounds like Yes means yes, but it doesn't say what voluntary agreement is or what reasonable is. It, it doesn't say you have to produce a contract and say, sign here. Do you agree I take off your clothes? Do I agree that, you know, we move on to the next step of, of this uh, situation? It isn't completely clear. And I think this is where the misunderstanding often happens. Yes does mean yes, but how do you... How do you define yes? Is it uh, the person being silent? No, the law says that's not enough. It's also the subjectivity of the person who is receiving the signals, the information to determine whether that is yes. But again, the law has its view on that. So you're a big yes means yes, uh, you argue for that, but does it need to be clearer? Does it need to be stricter in law? Well, I think one of the advantages of the California law is that uh, it, it, it gets quite specific about what doesn't constitute consent. And as you mentioned, you know, silence doesn't constitute consent. That is made clear and explicit in the California law. It also indicates that a lack of resistance doesn't constitute consent. Uh, the Canadian law doesn't get into specifics to quite that same degree. And I think that uh, as a result of that, it's subject to the interpretation of the people who are actually enforcing the law and their understandings of consent. Yeah, and I, I'm not here to argue against the notion of consent for Pete's sake, but I also think there's a difference between um, the fine points of the law and how things would be litigated after a sexual encounter that somebody says, no, absolutely, I did not give consent, and the way real life works. I mean, you, you saw it in the, the video there, the idea of actually handing somebody an iPhone and saying, please check here. It's a lovely idea, but in real life, I'm not sure it's going to happen. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not here to argue in favor of the idea that, uh, you know, regret is, is a good thing or sexual aggression is a good thing, but I also think the law and reality uh, and real life aren't necessarily the same. 
Yeah. I think one of the beautiful things about our legislation around affirmative consent, or yes means yes, is that uh, it doesn't specify that you have to explicitly say, yes, I want to go through with this activity. It could mean that you're communicating it through your body language. It could mean that you're communicating it through your facial expressions. Mm -hmm. And yes, that, that you know, some people might think that that makes things murky, but really what affirmative consent is all about is being invested in the pleasure of your partner to the same degree that you're invested in your own pleasure. Well, and being able to consent as well. And this is the issue too. Um, if somebody is incapacitated, they cannot give consent. Um, that used to be a defense in law if the person said, well, I, you know, I thought she gave consent, but she actually, in fact, was too drunk and could not do so. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things that frustrates me, though, is that we have a lot of emphasis on consent, which I think is important, but we have no real discussion of how it is to actually reduce the risk that you would be in a situation where someone could assume consent or force you to do something you don't want to. And college campuses in particular, there's a very little conversation about saying, look, if you're going to be drunk at someone's apartment at two in the morning, you might be at risk. It's not saying you're at fault of what might happen to you, but you might put yourself at risk. And I don't think that message is being communicated to the same extent as consent issues and the yes means yes conversation. And I think it's important that, that you've articulated that because a lot of people will jump in and say, well, that's blaming the victim. Exactly. But you know, Camille Paglia it's will not. say that uh, women should be more like gay men. They should just assume that almost any situation can turn sexual and be in a position to put a stop to it. And in order to do that, then you do have to assume a certain degree of responsibility. It's a bit like civil court where you say, well, it's not 100% the other person's problem. Is yeah, binge but... drinking on campus, is that part of the problem here, Steph? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the problem with that mentality is that, uh, that it suggests that women aren't already being bombarded with messages telling them to be very careful when they're drinking. And I mean, I am a young woman. I got that message a million times while I was growing up uh, to be careful with my drinks, to be careful about the situations in which I allow myself to get drunk. There's no shortage of conversation happening around that in our society. What there is a shortage of is conversation around, you know, if you are in a situation where you might be in, about to engage in sexual activity with someone who's very drunk, consider the fact that that's not a legal thing to do. See, I disagree because we see so much of a conversation on college campuses revolving around consent, and yet the imagery that we get is that those messages of, you know, do not drink to excess, do not put yourself in a position of risk, don't seem to be getting through because you do see a lot of these situations involving abuse of alcohol and drugs and other intoxicants. Well, yeah, because women should be allowed to drink and still not get raped. I understand, but at the same time, you put yourself at risk. I'm not saying they're at fault, and that goes to what you were saying of blaming the victim. It's not blaming the victim. It's like saying you don't drive without wearing a seatbelt, you don't skateboard without wearing a helmet. There are risks you can reduce risk of harm to yourself. Just want to move on. We saw a, a clip in the setup piece from that young fellow saying, I'm not scared, but actually this could ruin my life. <laughs> uh, men are concerned that they could be unfairly accused here. It sounds like all of the laws that we're talking about or rules still come down to a a matter of interpretation of it, it's not a contract. Well, and also he said, she said. I mean, there are only two people in that situation, in that bedroom, in that encounter, and the law does seem to favor the woman. Um, and, you know, I don't want to relitigate because it hasn't even been litigated, but the situation with the MP on Parliament Hill, you know, the notion, as you mentioned, of her not having said something. She never actually said no. But again, within the law, that is a sexual aggression on his part, that she provided him with Could a condom. Could be a sexual aggression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, allegedly. Um, so, right, it's, it's murky. And I think men find themselves on tenterhooks these days in some respects because they feel in this debate they're kind of being accused of always being on the verge of being rapists. Well, what's interesting to me is that the law itself is genderless, right? It doesn't say men must do this and women must do this. And let's not forget that there's same gender partnerships and all of that too, which, you know, the whole he said, she said thing doesn't even really apply to. But uh, the thing is that Affirmative consent is really about, uh, it's about listening and paying attention to your partner's cues. And if the law might differentially impact men versus women, I think that's because of the different ways that men and women are socialized to understand sex and consent. I mean, men are taught to, uh, to view sex as a conquest, to view it as an achievement, to view it as something that proves what kind of man they are. And that doesn't necessarily, that's not very conducive to paying close attention to your but partner's women, cues. But women also play into that because the traditional notion of courtship, whereby the man will push and push and try and move from first to second, you know, the old traditional <laughs> yeah. basis. Um, women also play a part in that. You, you have movies, um, you know, like um, Fifty Shades of Grey and other fantasies that are out there that feed also the notion, and not to mention pornography, um, that feed the notion that 
that no means just try harder. So oh, you have sure. to combat that. We're almost out of time. We only got it like a minute and a half right. left. So just a quick point on like, where is this going? It, it doesn't sound like there's an easy fix in the law. Mm. Is it through education? You were, you know, even on you in, talk about movies and in, in porn, a lot of young people start seeing porn at a very mm -hmm. early age where consent is not really the focus. Um, so instead of the law, should the focus be on education, teaching relations and not just how to put a condom on a banana in, <laughs> uh, in, in high school? Uh, um, I'm a big believer in education. I think it can make a difference. And if you raise young men, and let's face it, this is more an issue, I think, of male behavior, to be gentlemen than hopefully more of them will be so. But I also think there is a certain inherent aspect to, way, to the gender relations that men and women have. Not that that ever excuses a man for crossing the line, but the, 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 this is very hard to, to, to fight. Yeah, I think also you have to um, be... The problem is prosecution of this is so difficult, but I think at the same time, we have to move towards a place where women feel safe bringing forward accusations because if a person, if men know, not to stereotype, if men know that they could be held up on charges of rape, women, that would be, I think, would impact their behavior and there would Last be less. Last very quick point, sorry. Yeah. Steph? I think, uh, I think that education can bring us to a point where students and young people and all people have a more nuanced understanding of consent. But in order to get there, we need a sex education curriculum that's willing to address the desire and pleasure. Without that, you can't have a meaningful understanding of consent. Thanks so much. Quite the discussion. <laughs> Thank you.